Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here. And on behalf of our whole worship team, I wanna say thank you so much for joining us today for this service of worship at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We believe that you are going to encounter God today in this time. And so we are so grateful that you have intentionally taken this time out of your day. We'd love the chance to connect with you. So if you would take a moment and either click the link that's in this video description or scan the QR code that will show up on your screen in a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here and let us know how we can be praying for you. We truly want to be a community of prayer. Now I invite you to take a big deep breath and let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please join me now in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be found on your screen. Let's pray now together. God, make us fertile soil. In this time of worship, till our hearts so that we will grow your fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In our daily lives, keep us from striving. And instead, help us trust the work you are doing in us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor David Haley, one of your associate pastors, and it's my great privilege to lead us in our morning prayer. So I invite you to uh, bow with me, and as I pray during the prayer, I will pause to give you the opportunity to speak the names of persons that you would especially like to remember in prayer today. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, you planted us by living water that we might be rooted in righteousness. You call us to be holy as you are holy. 
assured of your love, help us to cast aside all fear that we may love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus, you have shown us how to love one another. May our love for you overflow into joyous service and be a healing witness to our neighbors. We pray for many troubled areas of the world today. We especially pray for peace in Israel and Gaza and Ukraine and in all the other troubled areas of the world. God of mercy and healing, you who hear the cries of those in need, hear these prayers of your people that all who are troubled may know peace, comfort, and courage. We especially pray today for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Loving God, open our ears to hear your word and draw us closer to you that the whole world may be one with you as you are one with us through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as Jesus taught his disciples and still teaches us to pray today, so now we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we continue in worship, and we just remind you that giving offerings to God is an act of worship. You can worship God with your giving uh, through the U.S. mail, um, through dropping checks off by the church office, and also by using the uh, cell phone app or the church website. May God bless you as you reflect upon your investment in the kingdom of God. Amen. And now it's time for the children's message. So if you have children uh, or youth nearby who aren't already watching this video, uh, now's a great time to call them over. Hey guys, I'm Pastor David, one of your associate pastors, and I get to share the children's message with you today. And I'm really excited about our topic today because today we're continuing to think about the fruit of the Spirit and specifically we're thinking about the last fruit on the list, which is self-control. Now, I want you to help me with an experiment um, that has to do with seeing how much self-control that we have. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set a timer on my cell phone. Uh, I'm setting it for 30 seconds. And for the next 30 seconds, whatever you do, do not think about the color red, okay? Don't think about the color. Uh, some of you are already doing it. Well, it's okay. I haven't started the timer yet. Don't think about the color red. All right, here goes the timer. All right, 29, 28. So don't think about roses or stop signs. Um, don't think about apples. Try not to think about hearts or strawberries. Don't think about cherries or fire trucks. And above all, don't think about blood. Okay, only five seconds left. 
Whatever you do, don't think about, oh, there goes the timer. There. Well, how did you do in the experiment? Uh, how many thought about red? Oh, yep, yep, I see. That's almost all of you. I think it is all of you. Boy, that was really hard not to do, especially when I was talking about things that have the color red and even uh, flip my, my stole. Why do you think it was so hard to follow my instructions and not think about the color red? Well, obviously, it was because we need a little more self-control. But it's really hard sometimes. Have you ever been so hungry, but a parent told you, no snacks before dinner time? And boy, that was awfully tempting. Or maybe they said, all right, you can have one cookie. And how many did you take? Two, three, a handful? Yeah. Um, or what about when a teacher says, no talking in class, but you're sitting right beside your best friend and you can't help but have a little conversation. Yeah, we need more self-control. How about you need to do homework, but you really want to watch that TV show or you, you really want to get to the next level of that video game. Self-control. We need more self-control, and we need it every day. Now, the Bible tells us that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. And that just means that God can help us to have self-control. So, we just need to pray to God for God to help us to have more self-control. Let's pray. Lord God, we just pray that you will help us to have more self-control uh, because we know it will help keep us uh, from getting into trouble sometimes and messing things up. Help us, Lord, each and every day to have self-control and all the fruits of the Spirit. We give you thanks for the children and youth of our church and community and their families, and we just pray your blessing on them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've come to the very end of our series on the fruit of the Spirit, and I hope that you have been inspired, that maybe you've learned some things or perhaps uh, remembered some things along the way. Uh, we are finishing up today uh, talking about uh, self-control, and D Pastor David just shared a good children's sermon to help explain self-control and how difficult that can be. Um, we're going to look at a particular event in the life of Jesus um, that may not strike you uh, exactly like you would, you would think of when you think about self-control, but it is all about self-control. Um, so dive in and see if, if you understand what I'm, what I'm saying. I'm going to pick up in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, he'll command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they'll bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, we are tempted daily 
Lord, give us the strength to pass the test, controlling ourselves and giving our lives over to you. And now I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we finally made it to the last fruit of the Spirit. How are y'all doing? You've been keeping up with it throughout the fall? Have you given much thought to how the Spirit could cultivate more fruit in your life? Are you open to becoming more loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, and gentle? Good. Because we've got a tough one this week. Self-control. Yep, the week we all sit down to eat the largest meal of the year and then follow that up with the biggest shopping day of the year, we get self-control. I suspect we're all going to be tested this week. Speaking of tests, around middle school, I learned that I had the gift of curiosity. Actually, I didn't recognize it at first. My fellow students saw it in me, and they saw that my questions in class would sometimes take up time from the teacher's lesson plans and could even lead to the postponement of tests and projects and other assignments. So true story, more than once, a classmate would come in and say to me, I haven't studied for today's test. See if you can get the teacher to talk about something, anything, just for a few minutes so I have time to look over my notes. I became very popular among my friends and a pain in the rear to my teachers. People naturally get anxious when they know they're being tested. We may fail. Our weakness, our inadequacy... Our ignorance or our lack of preparation might be exposed. We know that every one of us could be given a test that we might fail. It just depends on the test. For instance, without looking it up, could you name all 66 books of the Bible? Could you name all the countries in South America? Could you run a 10-minute mile? There are lots of tests that aren't so easy to pass. Our story for today is about a test, a test of self-control. It's not a test to get a good grade, but rather a test used to see if Jesus is ready to begin his ministry. Let's look back on what has happened so far in the book of Matthew. Now, this is not a test. I did not ask you to read beforehand. But in Matthew chapter 1, he spells out the genealogy from Abraham to Jesus and then tells us Jesus' birth story from Joseph's perspective. Now we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. In Matthew chapter 2, we get the famous visit from the wise men in the east. And Joseph is told in a dream that he needs to take his young family to Egypt to escape King Herod. By the time we get to chapter 3, there are 30 years that have passed from chapter 2 to chapter 3. Jesus is now an adult and he gets baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. Pastor Julia told us about that story last week. Well, now we're in chapter 4, where Jesus is tempted by the devil. After that all-important scene, he, Jesus will then go forth to preach, call the first disciples, and heal the sick. So we've seen baby Jesus and baptized Jesus, but before he starts his ministry as bread of life Jesus, he has to pass this test. What kind of Savior and Lord, or King, Deliverer, Redeemer, Messiah, is Jesus going to be? There are lots of options to choose from. Just as we know there have been people in our lives who've wanted us to be what they wanted us to be, there are those who had in mind for Jesus something other than what God had in mind. It reminds me of a roommate that I had back in college who once told me, I get so tired of people asking me what I'm going to do when I graduate. I tell them I'm going to be a plumber. I said, a plumber? You don't know anything about plumbing. What if somebody asks you to fix something in their home? What would you say? He says, well, I always say, well, we haven't studied that part yet. And generally, they stop asking me questions. By the way, he did not become a plumber. He became a psychologist. Well, in the desert wilderness, Jesus is all alone. He fasts, he prays, he wants the hunger of his body to join the hunger soul. What does it mean 
to be Son of God, the Son of Man? What does it mean to be both human and divine? These are important questions that lead us to the first test. Here's the setting. Jesus is famished from lack of food and probably exhausted from not getting much sleep at night either due to the wild animals who are roaming around looking at him as if he might be a tasty snack. He's weak. His defenses are down. He's vulnerable. It's then that the tempter, the tester, the old pail and horns come up to Jesus and says, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Will Jesus spend his life feeding physical hunger, his own and that of others? Certainly a worthy cause. But as important as addressing human need for the necessities of life is, that is not going to be Jesus' primary vocation. Jesus quotes from the scriptures that he learned as a boy at the synagogue. One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus sees what's at stake here. Call it the spiritual dimension. Call it the image of God that's been stamped on our very being. This test enables Jesus to gain clarity about his calling. He knows it's possible to have a full stomach and an empty soul. It is possible to gain the whole world, but lose your life in the process. It's possible to have everything we want, but not what we really need. So Jesus refuses to reduce life to things, and he tells the devil no. The next test that Satan gives Jesus requires going to the very top of the temple, the tallest building around back in those days, Again, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For the Scriptures say, God will command the angels, and they'll catch you before you hit the ground. In other words, if you're the Son of God, prove it. Jesus saw what was at stake in this test, too. Not only is His call to be the Son of God, it's also to be the Son of Man, the human being. God's love is going to be expressed through solidarity with His beloved children. So Jesus, the human being, will not defy the law of gravity. In Philippians 2, there's an early profession of faith that asserts that even though Jesus had the right to remain safe and secure in his divinity, he saw equality with God not as something to be grasped and exploited for his own advantage. Rather, he emptied himself, becoming a human, a servant, one who would die, die even on a cross. That's not someone who is selfish, self-interested, or self-absorbed. That's someone who's selfless. Jesus says to the tester, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And yet, we come to the third test. Now from the pinnacle of the temple, the tester takes Jesus to the pinnacle of a very high mountain, and there shows him all the kingdoms of the world. He says to Jesus, all this can be yours if the price is right. And the right price is down and worship me. Give me your loyalty. I'll give you political power. I'll stuff the ballot box. I'll give you the election. Forget blue states and red states. They'll be whatever color I make them. Well, Jesus would be king, but not that kind of king. He's going to rule. But not that way. Jesus says to the tester, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus saw what was at stake in this test. To whom will he devote his life? To whom will he set his life's agenda? The tester left him and the angels came and ministered to him. Well, here it is 2,000 years later. How might these tests be our tests too? Number one, turning stones into bread. This is the temptation to reduce life to survival, to securing our lives, to allowing the world of stuff to seduce us into believing that if we buy whatever is being sold, we'll finally be happy. If we have enough toys, we'll be satisfied. It's the lie that no matter what the trauma or the tragedy, the remedy is to just go shopping and get more. Number two, jumping from the pinnacle of the temple. 
This is the temptation to believe the delusion that we are so special, that we are so different from everyone else, that we won't actually suffer the consequences that others suffer. We sometimes see this from celebrities on TV or the internet who are filled with too much pride. They believe the law of gravity doesn't apply to them either. But it happens to us too. We think we can do this, it won't hurt. We can do that, we'll get away with it. Our self, our ego is out of control. Which brings us to number three, the temptation of power. Christians are forever tempted to believe that salvation will come if only the right candidate or party will come into power. Jesus saw that real change won't come through legislation or laws or enforcement of those laws. Jesus knew that security cannot be bought no matter the number of bombs or missile defense systems or border guards or airport x-ray machines or prisons. Jesus knew that ultimately the power of love will have to replace the power of fear. The power of forgiveness must replace the power of revenge. That until inner transformation and control of oneself takes place, outer measures to defend and protect oneself will always be inadequate. So how are you being tested? Where do you lack self-control? What assumptions need to be tested in your life? What stories do you keep telling yourself? Like... I just can't stop smoking. I can't control my temper. I can't start exercising. I can't change. I can't live within my means. I can't live without my possessions. I can never love again. I can't stop hating. I can't forgive. I can't break bad habits. I can't resist my addiction. I can't be content with what I have can't stop blaming others. I can't be honest. I can't reconcile an estranged relationship. I can't share what I have. I can't possibly put God in the driver's seat. I can't live as God's child. I can't say yes to God's call. I can't follow Jesus. You know, Jesus was tempted for 40 days. And those 40 days are the paradigm for Lent. That, of course, takes place in late winter and early spring. But what about the next 40 days from now? 40 days from now would take us up to New Year's weekend. How many times are you going to be tested between now and then? Through Thanksgiving, Advent, and Christmas. Tested with food. Tested with uncomfortable family discussions tested with your credit card, tested to do more, tested to run away from it all. Look, it isn't a sin to be tested. You may not like being tested, but it's okay. That's life. When you're being tested, ask God to give you strength to pass the test. Don't fret over it. Pray over it. And even if you fail the test, Know that God still loves you. That's grace. Now, grace doesn't give us a license to sin, but it does give us the freedom to begin a new life. A new life where the old assumptions no longer apply. So that instead of saying, I can't because I don't have enough self-control, you can say, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Let's go back and reread our assumptions again. I can stop smoking. I can control my temper. I can start exercising. I can change. I can live within my means. And I can live without my possessions. I can love again. I can stop hating. I can forgive. I can break bad habits. I can resist my addiction. I can be content with what I have. I can stop blaming others. I can be honest. I can reconcile a relationship. I can share what I have. I can put God in the driver's seat. I can live as God's child. I can say yes to God's call in my life. 
I can follow Jesus because I'm living for God and not for myself. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, perhaps we live outside of our own control because we struggle knowing exactly what you want from us. Help us to shed all of the false assumptions about who we're supposed to be and help us to live as your child knowing that we are loved and that we don't need all this other stuff or more power or the belief that we can get away with it all, with some, some type of sin. Instead, help us to rest in you, safe and secure in your control. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, may have been the ultimate when it comes to self-control, precisely because he knew who he was, and he knew what was needed, and he knew what he didn't need. And so he was able to throw off all those other things. And he also knew whose he was. He was his father's son. And you too are a child of God. And so I invite you to rest secure in the knowledge that you are loved. And you don't need all these other distractions and delusions. And hopefully that will help you with your own boundaries. Knowing that you don't need those things in order to bring you fulfillment but just rest in the knowledge that you will always, always be loved by God. Go forth in peace. And may the love that comes from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.